Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second installment of our thrilling first ever National Constitution Center <laughs> Bill of Rights Book Fair. Uh, for those of you uh, who are joining us for the first time on C-SPAN, let me uh, introduce this great event uh, briefly one more time. I'm Jeffrey Rosen, the President and CEO of the National Constitution Center, which, as our audience knows, is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And this book festival is part of a day-long celebration. Today, December 15th, Bill of Rights Day, which is the 225th anniversary of the proposal of the Bill of Rights, uh, of a new exhibit opening at the Constitution Center, which displays one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights. And this was one of the copies that George Washington sent to the states uh, on October 2nd, uh, 1789, we're displaying it with rare copies of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. If you happen to be nearby Philly or want to jump on a plane uh, uh, today, you can get uh, a $5 admission to the museum and, and see the Bill of Rights. But I hope that around the country and around uh, the world, people will join us both here at the museum and online to learn about how the rights that were promised in the Declaration of Independence were implicit in the Constitution and finally codified in the Bill of Rights. I am now thrilled to introduce uh, an old friend and a very distinguished scholar uh, who's written a superb book called The Great Debate, Edmund Burke, Thomas Paine, and the Birth of the Right and the Left. Uh, Yuval Levin is a Hertog Fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, founder and editor of the superb journal National Affairs, a prolific scholar and journalist, uh, a member of the, he's been executive director of the President's uh, Council on Bioethics. Uh, and this book, uh, described by the Washington Post as a thoughtful introduction to this famous paradigmatic opposition, I think that's understating the case. What this magnificent book does is uh, in terms that are both deep and scholarly, but also beautifully written and entirely accessible, shows how this intellectual debate between two pillars of the Enlightenment, Thomas Paine and Edmund Burke, has come to define many of the debates around the world and in America today. And we began our great Bill of Rights Festival discussing the First Amendment and the natural rights theory that under, underlay it and Madison's feeling that uh, laws restricting criticism of public officials violated the natural right, which comes from God and not government, to express one's opinions freely. And what Yuval does in this book is give us a much deeper context for how that natural rights philosophy was broadly shared among the American framers, Madison, Jefferson, but really was given its most fiery and compelling popular expression in the work of Thomas Paine. And then he contrasts Paine's vision with that, a very different vision, uh, that of Edmund Burke, um, uh, which far from being rooted in the individual natural rights of, uh, of all men was focused more on the organic evolution of society and emphasized gradualism and tradition over justice and uh, individual choice. Um, Yuval, first of all, welcome to the National Constitution Center. Thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, describe um, the fact that uh, Payne and Burke knew each other, first of all. They actually met. Uh, talk, talk about their, their meeting. They were, they were both opposed to, the, um, uh, to, to Britain's conduct during the War of American Independence. How did they meet? Yeah, it's one of those extraordinary things about the debates of that period is that they took place in a very small world, a small world of, uh, of Anglo-American elites who frequently knew each other. Burke and Paine had, as you say, been on the same side of the American question in somewhat different ways. Paine certainly much more radically so. Uh, Paine was one of the great champions of American independence right here in Philadelphia, uh, having immigrated uh, here from Britain as a, uh, as a man in his early 30s. Um, after the American Revolution, Paine found himself drawn to what was happening in France. And by the time of the French Revolution, was in France and very involved and very engaged in the debates that preceded their revolution and saw it as his purpose to make the case for revolution in France to the English-speaking world. Um, that meant that he also spent a fair amount of time in London 
And the first time he came back to London after, uh, after first having gone to France, he sought out Edmund Burke, who he thought of as a kind of kindred spirit, since Burke had been one of the few members of parliament who had very aggressively championed the American cause, or at least opposed the British government's treatment of the Americans. And so they met. Uh, they met first for dinner uh, in, uh, in, in August of uh, 1787. And uh, they spent a week together after that, a little bit later that summer. And from all accounts, they got along pretty well. Uh, by that point, the two of them were expressing pretty different views. And of course, not long afterwards, uh, they became really champions of the two opposing camps in the debate over the French Revolution. Um, even around the American question, Burke and Paine had expressed different views. They both supported the Americans, but for quite different reasons. Paine, as you say, made a fundamentally philosophical argument, an argument that it's really a case against monarchy, not just a case for an American break with the British monarchy. Um, Burke thought Parliament had the right to do what it was doing to the Americans, but that it was just a stupid thing to do and a mistake and would result in the breakup of the empire. Uh, and so he opposed it on much more practical grounds. And so we have to assume that their differences became apparent to them uh, when they spent some time together, but they were certainly apparent to everyone not long after that. Uh, wonderful. So they actually met August 1787, a, a, a month before the Constitution was, yeah. in fact, proposed. And you have some interesting thoughts about how Paine might have had some questions about the Constitution. He favored a unicameral legislature, mm -hmm. didn't like bicameralism. Tell us some of the structures of constitutions that he favored that differed from the ones that ended up in the US Yeah, it's an interesting thing. Burke and Paine are both basically silent about the American Constitution, even though it's a subject that you would think would be of enormous interest to both of them. Burke says a few vaguely nice things about the structure of the Constitution in a parliamentary debate. Paine, we just don't know. Uh, even in private letters, as far as we know, he never expressed an opinion pro or con during the debates about ratification. Um, Paine was certainly not friendly to the complicated structure of the American Constitution. Um, he always argued for much simpler constitutional systems. He wanted a unicameral legislature. Uh, he wanted no executive. You can see some of his constitutional thinking in the original Pennsylvania Constitution. He was one of the several authors of that document. Um, and it was very, very different from the American Constitution. He believed in much more direct democracy was in a sense a much more radical Democrat than most of the American founders. And I think it's safe to say that he had a lot of problems with the American Constitution, but he was careful never to say so. It was much more in keeping with Burke's way of thinking about the, the dangers of power, the need to divide and channel power. Um, but he, too, didn't say much. It's one of, these, one of the great frustrations of, uh, of Burke's scholarship is that there's a letter from a great friend of his in Ireland who sent him a copy of The Federalist and said to him, I'm going to be in London in a few weeks and we should talk about this. And if only that trip had been canceled, we might have a letter back from Burke saying what he thought about the Federalists <laughs> and what he thought about the American Constitution. But presumably this conversation happened at some point and we just have no idea uh, what his view was. What, what, what do you think he would have made of it? Well, I think he would have been impressed with the Federalist. Um, and I think we know that he was generally, as I say, impressed with the American Constitution. But Burke, Burke had a complicated relationship with the American Revolution and with the American regime. He was, as we've said, basically a friend of American independence, but he always wanted the argument for American independence to be understood in practical terms. He was very resistant to the philosophical case for American independence. He says nothing about the Declaration of Independence, even in his private letters, though we know for a fact that he was present in Parliament when it was read to the members, so he was certainly aware of it. Uh, he never writes about Thomas Jefferson, He's very interested in other people. He writes a lot about Washington, a little about Hamilton, but he's, he's wary of the more philosophical and more radical side of the uh, American founding generation. And as you see in reading Burke, that was not his way of thinking about politics. Okay, well, let's talk about the philosophical basis for the American Revolution as articulated by Paine. You mentioned the Pennsylvania Constitution, which he had a role in drafting. When you go to our great interactive in the Bill of Rights gallery, you can click on any provision of the US Bill of Rights, see the First Amendment, and then compare it to the Pennsylvania Constitution of 1776 and see how similar in some ways the language is and how different. When it comes to the Second Amendment, for example, the US Constitution emphasizes a well-regulated militia. The Pennsylvania Constitution, which Paine helped to draft, was the only one of the revolutionary constitutions that explicitly recognized an individual 
right of self-defense. The others were more collective. And you can compare this. And C-SPAN viewers, you can do this online once the site is up and running. Uh, later this week, I should say. <laughs> and uh, I should also say that C-SPAN viewers, you can tweet your questions uh, to Yuval Levin um, to at Constitution Center, Constitution CTR, um, using the hashtag NCC Bill of Rights. So Yuval, I think your description of Payne's understanding of social compact theory is among the most clarifying I've seen, period. I, you, you quote Payne on page 93 of describing uh, what individuals retain and what they surrender when they move from a state of nature into civil society. I can't do better than you do. If you want to read from Payne, you can. But just give us the elevator speech for what Thomas Paine understood the purpose of government was and how its role was to protect natural rights in exchange for greater security and safety and protection of the alienable rights that were yeah. exchanged. Well, Paine makes a very stark Lockean case for the source of our rights in society. Uh, what we think of as the argument emanating from John Locke, I think it's fair to say that Locke's own argument is actually a little more complicated than that. But Paine argues that we have to understand individual rights as originating from the fact that every individual derives his rights directly and not through society. We have this famous uh, thought experiment, I think it's fair to say, of the state of nature where we understand society as arising. We should think about society as coming out of a situation in which independent individuals, completely separate from one another, come together by choice to form a society. And the compact they make with one another is the fundamental law of that society. It exists to protect the rights they have as individuals before society. It doesn't give them new rights. They don't get their rights from society. They bring their rights into society. And what it offers them is protection, that is physical safety, safety for their property, uh, and an ability to make use of their rights that they wouldn't otherwise be able to uh, in, in the state of nature. But basically, society just exists to protect the individual's right of choice, fundamentally. Uh, and ultimately, that's the purpose of society. It's a very stark and very radical way of understanding the sources of, of what we think of as political rights, liberal rights. Burke begins very early in his career by asking a very basic question about that idea, which is, if, it's, if, if in fact no human being has ever lived in such a state of nature, if there's no way that anyone ever existed outside of a society, then how does it make sense to understand our rights in society as deriving from a kind of experiment that has no relation to the reality of human experience? That is, isn't it a problem that the state of nature is just a thought experiment and in fact has never existed? What are rights in society, uh, rather than what are rights if we imagine ourselves outside of society where no person's ever been? And so Burke wants to make an argument for rights, and he is a believer in rights, and not only a believer, but it's very important to Burke not to let people with these more radical views of uh, democratic society take ownership of these terms. So Burke really insists on defining rights in his way, defining liberty in his way, defining equality in his way, not allowing all these terms to be defined only in the most radical possible way of understanding them. And he wants to say rights ultimately have to be understood as a function of a society that existed before us. Every human being has always been born into a society. No human being has been born outside of society. And so we have to understand our rights as inheritances, and we have to understand our rights as defining our relations to other people in a society. It's one way of seeing that Burke and Paine are both liberals. They're both arguing about the meaning, the nature of a liberal society, the kind of society we all know. But they argue about it from very different angles, from a very different point of origin. Paine always wants to understand the liberal society as an innovation, as a break from the past made possible by new insights that were gained in the Enlightenment. Burke always wants to understand the liberal society as an extension of the best of Western civilization, not as something newly discovered, but as something gradually built up and evolved over many, many generations, and so as something connected to the Western tradition, rather than as fundamentally a rejection of the Western tradition. And that debate between them ends up being a debate between a side that sees the liberal society as a break to be advanced, to be brought to full, uh, to, to, uh, fully into being, or as an achievement to be conserved. In that sense, a progressive vision of liberalism and a conservative vision of liberalism from the very outset has been the, the argument about the nature of the liberal society. 
beautifully expressed contrast between uh, two visions of the status of natural rights. I want to delve in just a bit because it's important for the audience to understand exactly which rights Payne and the other framers considered natural and which were civil and which natural rights were alienable and which were unalienable because if we don't understand that we can't understand why Madison thought the most important amendment in his list was the one that would have prohibited the states as well as the federal government from abridging freedom of speech and religious conscience. So I am going to read from Payne because I just thought this was such a great passage that you included. You said, um, moving from the state of nature to civil society, people trade freedom for protection, but they don't give up their basic pre-social or unalienable rights. And these are the natural rights, um, and you have to distinguish bet between rights you can individually exercise fully and perfectly, and those they cannot. Of the first kind, that is these unalienable rights, are rights of thinking, speaking, forming and giving opinions, and perhaps are those which can be fully exercised by the individual without the aid of exterior assistance. Of the second kind, the alienable ones that you can surrender in exchange for greater security and safety and personal protection, that word equal protection of the law is a term of art which you get from the state of nature, these include acquiring and possessing property in the exercise of which the individual power is less than the natural right. Thus, I consider to be civil rights and they're distinguishable from natural rights. In our next discussion, you'll see that the idea that this right not to be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process was considered an alienable rather than an unalienable natural right, and that's why um, the framers allowed for more restrictions on it. You've all, with, again, with thanks for letting me spell that out, add to help elucidate it, if you will, and then tell me and tell our audience what the consequence of this natural rights theory was for Paine's and Burke's views about revolution. You say that Paine emphasized the first half of the Declaration of Independence, mm -hmm. and Burke emphasized the second half. What did Paine believe that it's the people's duty to do when government infringes uh, natural rights rather than granting them protection? Yeah, w w what you really see in that quote is the, is the central place that Paine and others like him gave to human reason in political life. That is, they, they understood fundamentally that people come into society with a right to think freely. Uh, and that, that and that always remains a very important right to protect. And so that's one of the things that government can't restrict uh, and can't limit. Ultimately, w w what, what this can amount to for Burke and for Payne, as I suggested, they understood the liberal society in rather different ways. And the fact that uh, Burke emphasizes continuity and sees that society as having gradually evolved, in a, especially in the British experience, through the experience, the, the, the historical experience of trying to find a balance between order and freedom, and therefore trying to find the practical implications of the moral and philosophical principles that stand above society. For pain, those principles come first. Those principles are discovered directly by a kind of new science of politics in the Enlightenment and have to be applied to society. And in a sense, the purpose of government is to apply those principles. And to, uh, and to allow them to become real. Both of these views, I think, are evident in the American Declaration of Independence. Both the conservative view of the liberal society and the progressive one, the more radical one, are evident at the same time in the Declaration. The opening of the Declaration is a very radical statement of principles. Uh, it, it, it asserts rights, and it asserts the right to act on those when government uh, restricts them. So what Paine would say is if the government is not allowing you to exercise your rights, is not protecting your rights, you have a right to overthrow it and begin again, start over from the principles, build a government on those principles. That's certainly evident in the Declaration of Independence. It's an important part of the argument for revolution. But after stating those fairly radical principles, the Declaration makes a turn, a turn toward a list of grievances that the Americans have for justifying why it was time for revolution. And those grievances, if you look at them, are all about continuity. They're accusing the king of not allowing them to keep the system of government they had before. They're not arguing in that second part of the declaration that they need to start over from scratch based on the right kinds of principles. They're arguing instead that they used to have a legitimate government and fairly recently the British government has started to, to rob them of their rights. And all of those grievances that are listed are basically about allowing the colonists to continue to preserve the political tradition they'd had. A much more conservative case for revolution. A case for recovering uh, 
for recovering a legitimate government. And reading the Declaration of Independence, you have to ask yourself, do these people think that monarchy is necessarily illegitimate everywhere? Or do they think that the particular monarchy they've been living under is treating them in an illegitimate way? I think the Declaration can be read both ways. Tom Paine cannot be read both ways. He certainly believes that monarchy is illegitimate, period. And the arguments that he makes, even at the time of the American Revolution, in Common Sense, his great uh, revolutionary pamphlet, is an argument against monarchy. Monarchy in Britain, not just in America, monarchy, period, is seen by him as illegitimate. It doesn't allow people to exercise their right to choose their own leaders, to choose their own future. Uh, Burke argues monarchy is one of the legitimate forms of government, uh, it, but it certainly has to treat its own people in a legitimate way. That debate, which is one form of the original left-right debate, is evident in the American founding and has always been part of our national conversation about politics from the very beginning. So this is one of your most provocative claims, that the debate between Burke and Paine expressed in the two parts of the Declaration of Independence itself uh, suffuses American history and defines the parameters of our current debates. You don't talk much about the 19th century and what happened between the Declaration and today. Would it be fair to say that the Burkeans of the 19th century were Calhoun and the defenders of slavery, whereas the Paine uh, acolytes were people like Lincoln and Frederick Douglass who invoked natural rights theory? Well, I don't think it's quite that simple. First of all, Burke himself was certainly an opponent of slavery on philosophical grounds, on, that is on moral grounds. He took it to be a question that was outside of politics um, and was one of the adamant abolitionists in English politics. Slavery itself had been abolished in British life by then, but the slave trade was very much a part of the British Empire and Burke wanted it ended. Uh, he was one of the first signatories of the Wilberforce petition. The first year that William Wilberforce put his petition out in Parliament, there were only four signatories and Burke was one of them. Uh, and so he certainly had no question about where one ought to stand on the slavery question. And I also think that Lincoln in his arguments shows the the, the presence of both of these ways of thinking about American life. That is, Lincoln, in a way, discovered memory in American politics. He makes a case, especially as president, he makes a case for understanding the American political tradition, which, remember, wasn't that old at the time, four score and seven years, uh, for understanding that tradition as an inheritance, as a kind of ancient tradition. He describes it as our ancient faith. It wasn't that ancient, but he understood why it was important, why it could be helpful to understand um, the principles of the American Republic as an inheritance and not just as an innovation. So I think Lincoln in himself contains both of these strands. So I wouldn't say that, he's, uh, th that he simply represents the more radical element of American life. Though Lincoln certainly was a fan of Tom Paine um, and understood himself as advancing a principled understanding of politics. It's important to see the Burkean tradition also advances a principled understanding of politics. Oftentimes the difference between the two ways of, of, of seeing the place of principle in politics has to do with the, the question of how we can know the principles and how they apply to specific political circumstances. Burke's complaint about Paine's way of thinking and the way of thinking of the radicals in France was that they thought you could take principles directly from a kind of political philosophy and just apply them like a formula onto political life. Burke argues Principles don't work that way in politics. We can never know them quite that explicitly. And the best way for us to know them is through the experience of political life. That is, a society as it develops, in a sense, rubs up against these principles and so takes on their shape. And so when you, uh, when you arrive at a question of principle in politics, one good way to, to answer that question is to think, what way of proceeding would be most like our best selves? Rather than saying what way of proceeding is demanded by a formulaic application of this or that principle, he thinks it's never that, the principles are never that reliable. Politics isn't math and it's not physics. It's always a way of society finding the best way to be more like its best self. And for him, that's basically the statesman's task, the political challenge. You give a powerful answer <coughs> uh, to the idea that Lincoln was exclusively an uh, acolyte of natural rights and say he embrace both Burke and Paine. What's your response in that spirit to the famous claim of Louis, Louis Hartz of, of Harvard, who wrote in his famous book, The Liberal Tradition, he began by quoting John Locke 
in the beginning, all the world was America. Mm. And Hartz argued that essentially America has always been Lockean and based in natural rights at its core, precisely because of the absence of feudalism uh, in American culture. And for that reason, Hartz said that the more Burkean tradition is not, uh, was not embraced by the framers and that all of whom were Lockeans. What's, what's the response to that? Well, th there's always been a strand among theorists and, and historians of America that wants to say that America started from scratch. Uh, that's in essence what John Locke was saying. It's, it's not, I don't think it's supportable by American history. That is, the American history doesn't actually begin in the American Revolution. And you can see that, again, in the American Declaration of Independence, which, which harkens back to a political tradition, which says we have been living in a certain way for several hundred years, and that way is now being denied to us, and we want to recover it. There is that demand for recovery, a kind of conservative assertion in the Declaration of Independence. Tocqueville offers a nice answer to this, too. In Democracy in America, he makes the case that America has always been democratic. But for him, that's not an argument for thinking that, therefore, the American case for democracy is purely a principled argument. On the contrary, he says, America's political tradition has always been democratic. And so the American people have the luxury of just continuing to live in their tradition in a democratic age, so that it, uh, American life is better suited <coughs> to a liberal era, but that's not to say that Americans are, have always been pure theorists, pure philosophers of democratic rights. America has had a long-standing democratic tradition, which is both democratic and a tradition, and therefore has room in it both for a certain kind of radicalism and a certain kind of conservatism. I think that's our great strength. The French Revolution was a struggle between these two sides, and one of them was going to win and the other was going to lose. The American Revolution contained both of these sides and so created a republic that has always contained them both and that has always, through the pull and push of these two, created a space where we can actually be a free people that at the same time value both liberty and order, value both tradition and innovation. I think it's our great fortune that we've had that history. Um, you talk powerfully about how uh, Paine is the uh, hero of today's progressives who support uh, rule by expertise. Paine also uh, embraced a prototypical version of the welfare state and uh, supported relief for the poor, whereas Burke, who focused more on the support of in traditional institutions like families and churches and markets, um, is the heir to modern conservatism. Are there aspects of Burke that are obsolete and don't speak to America. I mean, he wrote flattering letters to dukes where sure. he talked about the glittering wisdom of the inherited aristocracy mm -hmm. and kind of demeans, they're sort of, he, uh, they're particularly archaic uh, in that light. Yeah. Um, does, 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 does all of Burke, Burke's bill speak to us or is some of us, yeah. is some of him sort of uh, irrelevant? Yeah, no, no question about it. Burke, Burke is an Englishman and is working in an English tradition and in a late 18th century English context. And so certainly not all of that speaks to us. I also would say, to, to argue that Burke and Paine are the origins of left and right, I'm not making a kind of genealogical argument. I'm not suggesting conservatives are who they are because they've read Burke, uh, or that liberals are who they are because they've read Paine, but rather that life in a liberal society brings to the surface almost inevitably these two ways of understanding that society. One that sees it as a break, as trying to perfect a kind of theoretical construct. The other that sees it as an achievement, that's trying to refine uh, a long-standing accomplishment of Western civilization. These are two ways that arise over and over in the debates that especially the Anglo-American tradition sees, but debates that arise in liberal societies in general nowadays. Burke and Paine are useful because they are present at the outset of that uh, tradition and so offer us an especially clear debate about those principles. They're very clear. They argue about principles in very, very fundamental ways. They understand where they disagree a lot better than most people now do. Uh, and so they're very useful in helping us see the foundations of these ways of thinking. But I wouldn't say that they're simply, th 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 that they're fathers in a literal sense. And so I wouldn't say that uh, everything about Burke is useful to conservatives. Certainly not everything about Burke is shared by American conservatives. The American context has always been a different context. In fact, Burke himself, in, in speaking about the Americans around the time of the revolution, in one of his great speeches in parliament, uh, opposing the policy of the government, offers a kind of character description of the Americans. And it's a wonderful thing to read. It used to be read a lot in American schools. It's really not anymore. Uh, 
what he says first is that the Americans are obsessed with personal liberty. They're utterly obsessed with it. And he, he says they smell threats to their liberty in the air. Uh, they constantly see them coming. And in this way, they are different from their British cousins. And his argument against the British government was that this has to be understood about them, that if you're going to govern the Americans, you have to understand their character. And their character is an obsession with personal liberty. And he says they translate that obsession into tax policy, uh, <laughs> which is still true. They, they let taxes stand for liberty. And so it's especially a huge mistake to tax the Americans in a way they find obnoxious. Find another way to raise the money, he says to the prime minister. This is a terrible way to treat these particular people. So there's no question that there are differences of character between, uh, between Americans and Englishmen. And so not everything about Burke is relevant. But the basic disposition, I think, speaks to a lot of what we still think about now. That was a great uh, detail in his response to the British about why this isn't just a local tax matter. He's saying you're threatening the very character yeah. of Americans. He says, for them, you say tax, they hear freedom. That's, yeah. that's the American. And he was right. And there's a lot of that still. Yes, there is. <laughs> But I want to delve down onto this very provocative claim you make that uh, you know Burke is the heir to conservatives today to ask, who are the Burkeans among conservatives? You have a very subtle discussion at the end where you say, Paine was discovered by American conservatives in the 80s. Reagan quotes him at the 1980 convention. Yeah. And President Obama discovered Burke yeah. in saying that uh, he wanted to resist dramatic transformation of the welfare state and that he was a minimalist and a gradualist, which is a remarkable inversion. But at the, and, and also, as you note, conservatives appeal to natural rights theory, and certainly the sure. Tea Party uh, is full of uh, pain-like rhetoric. And we're about to, after this break, have a great discussion with Timothy, Timothy Sandifer, who mm -hmm. is a painian libertarian, I think, in yeah. every respect, and would, would not be a fan yeah. of Burke's gradualism. He's written a superb book about the Declaration of the Constitution. We're going to discuss Everybody it and have a phenomenal debate, so everyone has mm -hmm. to come back after lunch. Because, uh, but, it, but, but it feeds very yeah. nicely into your book. But who are the Burkeans among yeah, the Yeah, well, today? so I do offer Reagan and, and Obama as examples of an inversion. That is, I think that, that they're, they're, making, they're making arguments about Burke and Payne that aren't quite true to Burke and Payne. Uh, Reagan loved to quote Paine, but he quoted especially one line of his, in some sense the least conservative thing that Paine's ever said, maybe that anybody's ever said, uh, where, where, where Paine argued that we have it in our power to begin the world over again. Um, Reagan made this case in calling the American people to do great things again. That is, he wanted to say, we're not over. We still have, uh, we, we still have in us the capacity to do the kinds of great things that Americans have done in the past. He was not arguing for an end to religion and an overthrow of all social order, as Paine was. Um, I, I would say this. I, I think that the basic Burkean disposition is still very powerful in conservatives. And I think of it in three ways. And really, the, the debate between Burke and Paine can be thought about along these three kinds of axes. First of all, Burke begins in gratitude and not an outrage. That is, he looks at a world that is an imperfect world that has both good and bad in it, and he sees the good first and is impressed by the good first and wants to use the best of what we have to address the worst of what we have. He does this because he has very low expectations of human beings. He's impressed that anything works at all in society. <laughs> um, and so rather than start by saying things ought to be a lot better than this, he starts by saying things could be a lot worse than this. Um, <laughs> And he's first of all grateful. Payne begins by being outraged. Payne has very high expectations, again, because he thinks we've discovered the right way to do this. We have the right principles now. We just have, have all these oppressive governments standing in our way of applying them. And so things should be a lot better than this. And he is fundamentally outraged at the status quo at all times. Um, this difference is a difference you still see. It doesn't mean conservatives aren't outraged. Burke was outraged most of the time. But his outrage was about losing things we had losing great things that, had, that were the inheritance, the possession of the society that he was part of, rather than an outrage at not having things we ought to have. I think that difference still tells you a lot about the left and the right. Secondly, Burke had a very limited notion of what human knowledge and power could do in society. I think this difference, a kind of epistemological difference, is very, very important to understanding Burke. Burke thinks that the notion that you can have a scientific politics is the most preposterous thing that the radicals have proposed. He, he doesn't think that that kind of knowledge, that, that the sort of knowledge that's available to a physicist in solving a physics problem can be available to a statesman in solving a social problem. 
The knowledge we have about society is always dispersed knowledge and always partial knowledge. And so it's not possible to think of politics in technical terms. Paine wants to say that it can be, that science, including a science of politics, has a lot to offer us almost as a technical science in, in addressing social problems. And he wants part of what he expects out of government is that government will serve as a means of applying technical knowledge to social problems. Burke wants government to serve as a means of channeling social knowledge, to use the mechanisms we have for channeling the knowledge that's possessed by individuals in society, but is at no point possessed at the center, is at no point possessed as technical knowledge by anybody. These kinds of institutions are the institutions that exist between the individual and the state, the family, the community, religious organizations, civic organizations, and the market are ways of channeling social knowledge, of moving knowledge from the bottom up. And Paine is expressly hostile to all of these institutions because he thinks that they're not legitimate politically. They, they're not democratically elected. Nobody gave, nobody gave the Catholic Church a right to run hospitals, so how is it making decisions about who can run this or that? It's still an argument we have all the time. He believes that you can, that you can concentrate knowledge in the middle and apply it, and that as long as that's done legitimately, that is by an elected government, it's both an effective way to solve social problems and a legitimate way to solve social problems. Burke says all that's very nice, except it is not possible. We don't have that kind of knowledge. And so government has to serve as a way to enable the, 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 the intermediate institutions, the mediating institutions, to do what they do. That argument is still very much alive between left and right now. And you see it in our economic debates. If you think about the healthcare debate we're having in the last few years, it is exactly this argument. It is a debate about whether we solve a complicated problem by applying technical knowledge from the center or by empowering the institutions that, that apply diffuse social knowledge, in this case a market institution. A lot of the arguments that conservatives have with liberals, a lot of the debate about the welfare state today is about whether we should have concentrated institutions that apply technical knowledge or diffusing institutions that allow social knowledge to work. That's the education debate, it's the healthcare debate, it's a lot of our economic debates. So I think it's still very much a left-right difference. I, I, uh, who's the most Burkean uh, politician and who's the most Burkean Supreme Court justice? Well, the, first, the second one's easy. I think Justice Alito is easily the most Burkean Supreme Court justice. And th that's the most interesting expression of that is in how he differs from the other conservatives on the court. Um, Alito is very concerned for tradition, is very concerned for local differences, um, and is less concerned for a direct application of abstract principles. Um, I think he's certainly the most Burkean justice. I think he would say so. Um, he certainly is interested in Burke and knows a fair amount about him. Uh, with politicians, that's more difficult. Um, I think that there are ways, especially if you think about the kinds of economic debates we have, there are ways of seeing some of the people who are leading some of the reform debates on the right, people like Paul Ryan, people like Senator Mike Lee from Utah, understanding them as very Burkean figures, even though in their temperaments, they're, I think, a little bit more aggressive than Burke would have been. They're operating in different circumstances. But the kinds of substantive arguments they make are very Burkean arguments. Um, you know, most of the tenor and tone of the right sounds more like Paine than Burke, but I think that if you get past the tone, the substance is very Burkean. Um, you're absolutely right about Justice Alito, who came here and gave the most wonderful speech for our preview of the Bill of Rights Gallery uh, masterfully uh, talking about the relationship between New York and Pennsylvania and using George Washington as a figure that united them both. Um, and he is, of course, an incrementalist and has resisted claims to overturn precedents that some of his more pain-like colleagues uh, on both sides have embraced. That leads me to ask, what would Thomas Paine have thought about judicial review, namely the power of courts to strike down unconstitutional laws? You say that Paine thought that every age and generation must be free to act for itself in all cases. Uh, the past has had its chance. Now the present generation is entitled to ru rule. He would have required all laws to expire after a generation. How could he have justified unelected judges striking down a law passed by we the people in the here and now in the name of the dead hand of the past, namely the views of the framers who were dead and gone. Yeah, well, again, this is an issue where we don't have Paine's opinion from him. Um, I think it's fair to say that he would have had a fair amount of trouble with judicial review as it took shape in American history. Um, but then it's fair to say that he would have had a fair amount of trouble with 
the constitutional system as it took shape throughout American history. Paine argued, as you say, that every generation needed to be free of its predecessors in essentially the same way that every individual needs to be free of his neighbors. Um, this comes to be, I think, the, one of the most profound differences between Burke and Paine. One of the ways in which you see their differences most fundamentally is in how they think about the relationship between the generations. Burke thinks you cannot understand individuals apart from those generational relationships. No one is born into an empty world. Everyone is born into a world that exists before us. And so we're born into a web of relationships, of obligations and of privileges that we didn't create, that we didn't choose, and yet that are binding on us. For Paine, this was a problem, even though it was undeniably a fact. And he wanted a free system of government to liberate people from that as much as possible, to liberate them from generational obligations as much as it liberates them from oppression by people around them. Um, I think the place of the courts as it's taken shape would have been a problem for him in that respect. But again, it, the, the, the radicalism of the fundamental claim has to be understood. Now, Thomas Jefferson said something like this too. There's a famous exchange of letters yes. in September of 1797 between Jefferson and Madison where Jefferson makes something very much like Paine's claim. He says, every law should expire after a generation. The math he does for a generation is a little different from Paine's. But um, Madison writes him back this wonderful letter where he very gently sort of says, well, if you think about what things will look like on the day that all the laws expire, I'm not sure we really want to do that. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, 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 the radicalism of... Jefferson's kind of liberalism goes that far. And there are times when he was willing to take it to its logical conclusion. There are times when he wasn't. Uh, Paine always took it to its logical conclusion. And it results in arguments like those, for good and bad. This is great. I have a follow-up. I want to put in one more plug during our remaining 15 minutes for our great C-SPAN audience to tweet your questions to uh, at Constitution Center, Constitution CTR, using the hashtag NCC Bill of Rights. Um, so Jefferson and Paine questioned judicial review. By the end of his days, as you suggest, Jefferson was even questioning Marshall's insistent that judges did have the power to strike down unconstitutional laws, mm -hmm. as we'll learn about in our final talk of the evening. And um, does, uh, uh, in, 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 in that sense, um, what was Paine and Jefferson's alternative? Do they think people should literally rise up and exercise their, right, their unalienable right to alter and abolish government whenever it became subversive to the claims of civil society? Do they believe that there should be actual revolution when judges were tyrannical? Well, I'll tell you, one of the things that becomes evident when you think about that question is also illuminating, I think, of contemporary progressivism. Jefferson and Paine both thought that if you let democracy be democratic enough, these kinds of mistakes won't happen. That is. If the people really rule, and if the democratic system is answerable enough, if it doesn't have all these levers and all these uh, barriers to, uh, to, to allowing the people's will to be expressed, if it doesn't have all these divisions of power, um, it will express the public will. And that will mean that it is a legitimate system of government. It will also mean, Paine certainly argued, Jefferson I, I think was a little more careful about this, it will also mean that the people choose to be governed in a way that's compatible with this understanding of the potential of government to apply technical knowledge to society. One of the interesting things about 20th century and 19th century American progressivism is this combination of radical democracy with technocratic government. At the same time, uh, the early progressives tended to argue that there ought to be m many more mechanisms for direct democracy. People should be able to uh, to, to make their views known through referenda, they should be electing judges, they should, the Senate should be directly elected, and they believe that if this happened, people would choose to be run, to be governed by experts. Um, the constitutional system, I think it's fair to say, is opposed to both of these two ends. Uh, it's, it doesn't trust the people and it doesn't trust the experts. The Constitution doesn't trust anybody. <laughs> it says, let's assume everybody's wrong. What does a legitimate government look like then? And I think that's one of the best things about the Constitution because it's safe to assume that everybody's wrong. Um, running, a, running a country is a very complicated thing and it's likely that everybody in a great public debate is at least partially wrong. And so we have a system that doesn't allow us to make really big mistakes. Uh, but this is certainly drawn from the view that the potential for error is much greater than the potential for wisdom in politics. And so we need to protect ourselves from the former much more than we enable ourselves to benefit from the latter. 
I think that you've expressed beautifully the combination of a mis mistrust of human nature when it comes to exercising power, uh, a desire to create a government energetic enough to achieve common ends, but limited enough to protect liberty. This is, of course, the vision of the father of the Constitution, James Madison. Yeah. And this leads me to ask some, something uh, that I'm curious about. Did Madison read Burke? In some ways, he seems like the perfect amalgamation of Paine and Burke, both embracing Paine's natural rights philosophy, but Burke's suspicion of unchecked democracy. Yeah. Madison was very familiar with Burke's writings on America. Uh, we have a couple of letters between him and Jefferson about them. Jefferson also loved those speeches. Um, I, I don't know of any evidence that Madison read Burke on France, where Burke is more conservative, where Burke is much more, uh, is much more forceful in articulating his concerns about, uh, frankly, Jefferson's kind of approach to liberalism and democracy. Madison himself, of course, also changes, I think it's fair to say, or at least uh, emphasizes different things at different times in his career. The, the period when he is Hamilton's partner is very different from the period where he's Jefferson's partner. Um, and the fact that it's the same person is at the very least uh, mysterious. Um, he, he doesn't completely contradict himself, but I think Madison at different times is in different places on this very fundamental question. You mentioned France. Uh, to tell us about what Paine's support of the revolution was based on, what Burke's strong concern was based on, and in this matter, uh, uh, was Burke actually correct? Yeah. Well, so the French Revolution is much more radical than the American Revolution. Um, there were people both in France and in America who wanted to link the two, to see them as expressions of the same principle. Certainly, Paine himself wanted to do that and understood it that way. Um, but the French Revolution was not an argument between two different kinds of liberalism. It was, a, it, it was an attempt to put into place in a real place, in a real country, a very, very radical version of the liberal idea. Burke saw in this uh, the death of liberalism. He thought that the radicalism would make it impossible for a liberal society to function and to develop, um, and that the French revolutionaries, by breaking with the past, by throwing away all of their inheritance, and really trying to start over from scratch on principle alone, uh, would end up with disaster. And there's a famous passage in his great book, The Reflections on the Revolution in France, where Burke predicts what will happen. And what he predicts is essentially that it's, because it's impossible for these principles to actually function in practice, the French will turn on themselves and will create an opportunity for a military dictator to take over. And this very radical liberal revolution will end with the end of liberalism. It was easy to see, I think, the rise of Napoleon uh, at the end of the revolutionary period as proving Burke right. Um, Burke wasn't simply right about France because I in many ways the French Revolution did succeed. It, it planted seeds that have not gone away and that even contemporary modern France very much looks to. But I do think that he was largely right about how that kind of radicalism would play out in the life of an actual society. Paine was much more optimistic. He thought the principles are right, we're putting them into place, we're liberating the French public, and what, we're, what will result is a working liberal society. Um, this certainly seems not to have turned out that way, and Paine saw that himself. He was in France for the entirety of the revolution. By the end of it, he was in prison. Uh, he was in prison because he was friendly with the less radical of the radical elements of the, of the French regime, and he found himself in prison with a lot of his friends um, he spent more time in prison than he had to because he'd made some enemies in America. And so the American ambassador, uh, Governor Morris, refused to take him out of prison, basically. They said to him, Payne's an American. If you'd like to take him into your custody, you can. And he said, no, thank you. Um, <laughs> it wasn't until James Monroe became the American ambassador, a friend, of course, of Thomas Jefferson's and of Payne himself, that Payne was released from prison. So he spent over a year in prison. He saw what the ugly side of the revolution looked like. <clears throat> but he didn't sour on it. Even years after the revolution, in 1806, Paine gave a speech about France. He was back in America by then. And still was saying, ultimately, the principles were right. If only they'd lived up to the principles. Things you heard a lot from, uh, f f f from people uh, in the Soviet Union, for example, thrown out by one faction of the Bolsheviks against another. They still would say, the principles are right. The revolution is the right way forward. They just didn't do it right. Uh, so Paine never really gave up on that dream, but Burke's way of seeing this was 
was, was taken to have been right. And certainly in Britain, uh, he was pretty quickly understood to have uh, been right to be so worried about France. Um, d d Payne, uh, bad luck in his uh, friends, spent time in prison and was concerned about what would happen to his remains, as was Burke. Tell the remarkable story about how both Burke and Payne tried to control where they were buried, and <laughs> Payne had worse luck than Burke in this regard. Yeah, it, you know, so I end the book with this story. It's, uh, it, it's almost more symbolic than I know what to do with. Um, <laughs> it, it's, uh, so at the ends of their lives, both Burke and Payne made very strange requests about their remains. Um, Burke was concerned. Burke, Burke died in 1797. The French Revolution was still very much a living thing, and he was worried still that the ideas of the revolutionary would spread to Britain and was concerned that the, the champions of those ideas would see him as their enemy and uh, would basically take his body out of its grave. He didn't want to be buried in the family plot. He didn't want his lot to be that of his uh, son who had died before him or of his wife who was still alive but was set to be buried in the same plot. And so he wanted to be buried in an unmarked grave. And he said this to his family on what ended up being the last day of his life. He was sort of in, in, in a heavy fever. His, his family and friends, after he died, conferred about this and decided not to do it. They put him in the family plot anyway, and he's still buried there. Um, and, uh, but the, the level of his concern was extraordinary. I mean, he was sure that if the, if the radicals won in Britain, he would end up being... Uh, sort of untombed and, 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 and put on a pike. Um, this kind of thing had happened, of course. Uh, the British had done it to one of their kings. It wasn't that crazy. Um, Payne, as he, uh, Payne died in, in 1809 in the United States. He had by then written a book called The Age of Reason, which was basically an attack on Christianity. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was unwise, um, <laughs> <laughs> let's say. He wrote it while he was in France. Uh, he came back to America and found that for all of the very important role that he had played in the American Revolution, this book was the only thing anybody knew about him. And uh, it caused him no end of trouble. But uh, as he was on his deathbed, he asked, well, in his will, actually, in his written will, he asked to be buried in a Quaker cemetery. Um, his father had been a Quaker. He had given it up. He was, uh, we would now call him an atheist. Um, and was very upfront about it, again, having written a book about it. But he asked to be buried in a Quaker cemetery. His logic was very similar. He thought that the kind of people who might have it against him, who might, uh, might want to cause trouble after he died, wouldn't do it in a Christian cemetery. So um, his father had been a Quaker. Why wouldn't the Quakers let him? The Quakers, after he died, it was in his will, they said no. Um, and so Payne ends up being buried on his farm in New Rochelle in, in, in New York, in upstate New York. And his fear was not crazy because his body was exhumed from its grave, um, as it turns out by a great admirer of his who wanted to take the body to Britain and erect a great memorial to his great hero uh, in the town where Payne had been born in the south of England. The British government uh, also didn't like Tom Paine because he didn't like them very much. He had written a lot of uh, nasty things about the king and the monarchy. And so the person who took his body hadn't thought to ask permission before bringing it to Britain. <laughs> he asked permission after, and he was denied permission. Um, and Paine's remains were lost. Nobody knows where they are. Um, there have been all kinds of efforts, and you can imagine there are scholars who have made entire careers of these sorts of efforts. In the 20th century, there were several to try to figure out what happened to them, where, where he would be. Nobody knows. Um, and so Burke is buried with his family, and Payne has never been buried, uh, or at least no one knows where he is. Um, both of them were worried about their legacies, I think it's safe to say. And both of them have had very long and great legacies. Both of them have remained controversial in something like the ways they might have imagined, because the debates that they were so involved in contributing to remain live debates. They are still very much the disagreements we have. And so maybe they were right to worry. Phenomenal. Well, as Woody Allen said, uh, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and to connect it to our earlier discussion, Payne actually charged in Britain with seditious libel. That was yes, the reason that he couldn't was. be buried in America. He could not have been because of uh, Madison's objections and uh, uh, 
uh, the Supreme Court's eventual recognition. Three great questions uh, with just a bit of time to go. Here they are. We've talked about Burke's um, influence on Madison. The question here is how did Burke and Payne influence Jefferson? Mm. Well, um, Jefferson was a great admirer, like Madison, of Burke's writings on the American Revolution. He was not an admirer of Burke's writings on the French Revolution. Um, Jefferson was a fan of the French Revolution, almost to its end. Um, not quite as adamant as Paine, but uh, close, and was very much a Francophile in any case. Um, and he took Burke's writings about France to be sort of crazy. Um, there's a letter, and I don't remember who it was to, it might have been to John Adams, in which Jefferson says that he's much less worried about the revolution in France than he is about the revolution in Burke. Um, <laughs> He, he takes Burke to be contradicting himself, having supported the American Revolution, but so adamantly opposing the French Revolution. Um, and so the debate, and even the debate between Burke and Paine, was followed very closely in America. Um, the debate about the French Revolution, I think it's fair to say, had a role in launching the American party system. Um, it was a very, very controversial question here. And Burke's formulation of the argument against the revolution was very important here. It was important to Hamilton, for example. Jefferson very adamantly disagreed with Burke's reading uh, of, of France. Um, he was a friend of Paine's, uh, a close friend of his during the revolutionary years. Um, he, uh, he thought that Paine's uh, great pamphlet, Common Sense, was extremely important and ought to be distributed as widely as it could be and helped it get distributed. Um, he helped Payne to get a job as the secretary to the Committee on Foreign Relations of the Continental Congress. Um, and so he was a kind of patron of Tom Payne's in, in, in some ways. Uh, when Payne came back to America after France, Jefferson was president. <clears throat> he was wary of being associated with Payne's views on religion and so um, didn't hang out with him very much, but he helped him get established, he helped him get a job, and uh, the two were, knew each other very well, they were friends. Superb. Well, the most important rule of a National Constitution Center Bill of Rights book fair is that it end on time, so I'm afraid we're going to have to <laughs> skip the remaining two questions, but ladies and gentlemen, during our lunch break, we're going to reconvene at 1.15. Go see the Bill of Rights Gallery. Check out the interactive View one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights. C-SPAN audience, get on a train, get on a plane. There is still five hours in the day to come to Philadelphia <laughs> to see the original Bill of Rights. And if you can't make it today, it's going to be displayed for the next three years. Ladies and gentlemen, for a superb and enlightening discussion, please join me in thanking Yuval Levin. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs>